It's also a unique moment in history, I believe, in that there is a crisis of credibility. It's not just a financial crisis. It's a crisis of credibility of the kind of solutions that have been uh, posed and been said to provide uh, um, uh, liberation for, for humanity. Whether it's uh, the climate uh, crisis, whether it's the crisis of uh, the economy and finance, I think we have a problem in that fundamentally capitalism has come to a point where it is unable in and of itself to resolve those crises. The fact that millions and billions of people are, are, hung, are hungry across the world, the numbers are increasing. The fact that uh, um, increasingly capital is having to use the might of force to uh, uh, undertake invasions of places like Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and indeed Haiti today. The problem we face is that I don't think ever before in the last 125, 150 years have we been on the left so weak, so unable to connect with the social movements with the thinking and creativity that is going on. Uh, and that far too many of our uh, organizations in Africa and I think elsewhere Indeed, uh, um, many of the social movements in Africa um, still believe in Tina, that there is no alternative to capitalism. And I think that we have to really uh, address ourselves to say, how do we create a new world? How do we create? It doesn't have to be like this. We can produce, we can share wealth, we can feed people without the need to exploit. The, the Marshall Plan is often seen as an act of uh, grace, a support for Europe, to reconstitute Europe. What is forgotten is that this was done under market conditions, and under market conditions there is no such thing as a free lunch. But up to the Second World War, it was the main uh, colonial powers, Britain, France, Germany, Portugal, uh, some extent Spain, uh, uh, Germany, the, uh, the Netherlands, and so on, who hegemonized the rest of the world. They absolutely excluded any other competitors from entering their markets. And the US was, with the exception of Latin America, unable to penetrate. And yet it was facing a booming economy and a position where it had a huge surplus of, uh, as a result of uh, overproduction, both of commodities and capital. So the exchange that was made, and I think it's really important to grasp this, the exchange that was made was that in exchange for bailing you out of your, your destructive behavior over the last five years in the, in the Second World War, we want you to open your markets up. You want you to open up your colonies for us to penetrate. What we saw happening right across the continent of Africa, whether it was from Cape to Cairo, from uh, Somalia to Senegal, what we saw was an extraordinary phenomenon. In virtually every single country, people began organizing. People were organizing either in the villages, in the farms, in the factories, in the neighborhoods, wherever. We want self-determination. We want the right to organize. We want the right uh, to, to uh, freedom of expression, the right to work, and so on and so forth. That momentum just spread right across the continent. And it was this phenomenon which allowed the nationalist movements, uh, the nationalist uh, kernels of, of, uh, of, um, uh, of which eventually led to independence, to actually appeal to these organizations and to provide a political basis 
for a fight for independence. And it was extraordinary over the, that very short period by the 60s, very large numbers of 60s and 70s, very large number of those countries uh, won so-called political in independence. The political struggles were transformed. It was no longer about the right of self-determination, the right to organize, the right of freedom of expression, and so on. It wasn't about that any longer. It was saying it's about development. Development. And a social contract was then established between these organizations, these nationalist parties, which had come into government, and the mass movement. And the social contract was that in exchange for being quiet and stopping all this radical talk about freedoms, we will provide health care, education, social welfare, etc. Uh, for the population. If the struggles were about the right to organize, to have freedom of expression, right of housing, the right of women to organize, and so on and so forth, this was all replaced no longer by rights talk, no longer by political aspirations for self-determination. It was replaced by development. So the Oxfam, Soxfam, Boxfam, Boxfam, everyone in their bags came along with their parachutes and their special trip to build a well here and to build a well there, to build a hospital there and a school there. And I ask you, if we were living under the times of slavery, if we were living under the times of slavery, would we, the development brigade, be building schools for slaves? This system degrades humanity, that we have no role to support its perpetuation, that we would stand against the institution of slavery. That's what some of those NGOs would have done. But unfortunately, across Africa, that is not what they did. And let me say, that is not what they do. Um, capital uses crises. Now, we, are, we can predict, we can predict today that uh, we will see numerous crises occurring as a result of climate change. We will see flooding, we will see desertification, we will see all kinds of things. Uh, and whenever a country experiences a crisis like that, what capital does is to move in really fast. You should read Naomi Klein's uh, book, The Shock Doctrine, which she demonstrates some really good examples of how the, neo the neoliberals have worked out the strategy. Whenever there's a crisis, you move in, you sort out everything, you reconstruct society, you give opportunities to business for all sorts of reconstruction activities, etc. It's happened in, in Russia, it happened in Poland, it happened uh, in Chile, it happened all over the world. And it is today happening in Haiti. Yeah. The occupation of Haiti by US military troops is nothing short of a colonial occupation. There is not one, not one Haitian organization has been invited to discuss what the plans are. In fact, my email box is full of announcements from all these do-gooder NGOs who are going to do this, and build that, and build that. And I've written to every single one of them saying, and how many Haitians have asked what their priorities are? Not one answer from them. And I think that's the problem with the seemingly nice thing to do with humanitarian aid. If you take it, if you take it out of its political context, then you play directly into the agenda of the right. One of my, my, my favorite scientists, Albert Einstein, once said, you cannot solve the problem with the same kind of thinking that created the 